Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are so glad that you joined our webinar today, which is hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. My name is Lisa Thorpe. I'm a Quality Improvement Advisor with Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, and I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Our webinar is being recorded and will be posted in one to two business days on our website at greatplainsqin.org. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation, but please add any questions or comments to the chat and we'll be sure to have a discussion at the end. It is our intent with today's conversation to provide resources and tools to help and assist you in your work not to add to it. We hope through improved communication with patients, we can reduce burden with follow-up and also reduce unnecessary visits and hospitalizations. When we look at health literacy, it is found that adults with low health literacy experience four times higher healthcare costs, 6% more hospital visits and hospital stays that are two days longer than those with proficient health literacy. Information will be provided on using plain language to address these challenges with health literacy while keeping in mind the goals of culturally and linguistically appropriate services or class. And I now have the privilege of introducing our subject matter expert and our colleague, Dr. Kay Miller Temple. For 30 years, she has practiced internal medicine, pediatrics and hospice palliative care in urban and rural areas. She served in numerous leadership positions, including five years as chair of a Southwest Quaternary Healthcare Systems Utilization Review Committee. With a master's in journalism and mass communication, she is now in her eighth year as a writer, covering rural health topics for a federally funded National Rural Health Information Clearinghouse based at the University of North Dakota Center for Rural Health and housed in the University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Sciences. She has expertise in rural health literacy and plain language and speaks frequently on these topics. The fortunate circumstances of her birth allowed her to grow up on her family's South Dakota farm, originally homesteaded in the 1880s by her great-great-grandparents, and she continues to hold her rural upbringing as her primary identity. Dr. Temple, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thanks for inviting me to present. My name is Dr. Kay Miller Temple. I have no financial disclosures and the presentation content is not to be considered as an endorsement by my employer, employer or the federal government. I grew up on the family farm in South Dakota, homesteaded by my great great grandparents in 1883. Went to medical school at the University of South Dakota. My GME training in internal medicine and pediatrics was completed in Phoenix in the 1980s, and much later, I added the specialty of hospice and palliative care. The map's tiny red dots show my practice locations, and over the span of 30 years, I did locum tenens work. I was in private practice. My last 15 years, I spent in an academic setting as a hospitalist, and during that last stint, I also did some administrative work. But when I got to my double nickel birthday, I decided I wanted to learn one more thing before I was too old to learn one more thing. So I went back to school and got a master's in journalism and mass communication. Eight years ago, I made a career transition. I went to work at the University of North Dakota Center for Rural Health, which is housed in the state's medical school. I write original content for the Rural Health Information Hub, a national clearinghouse for rural health information, which is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, which is part of HRSA. Here are today's objectives, which will make sense to you if you speak CEU and CME language. And here are the objectives in planar language. And that's where I'm going to start, the languages of medicine. I believe we have three major languages in clinical medicine. There's a language of conversation we use with our patients. And have you ever stopped to think about what that language is called? Then there's the language we use in conversation with our peers. It's technical, it's professional, and those who overhear it call it jargon. And then there's the language of ICD-10, coding, quality, and billing, or what I call the codes of care language. And it has such impact that I've actually hyperlinked to a story here I wrote on that topic. 
So exploring our personal languages a little more, we all have what's referred to as our primary language. My primary language, a dialect of English, but I label it East River, South Dakota Farmese. It's a simple language, it's grammatically incorrect, and it's spoken at a high volume because we're either talking over a 30 mile an hour wind or farm machines or both, which often pushes us to default to sign language. But I also have several second languages. Some I'm fluent in, eh, some not so much. And I put this spoiler alert here because my first language is a product of my rural culture and our linguistics. And for my entire career, it has influenced my second languages. So those of you listening today have a primary language that is likely different than mine, but we probably have the same fluency in some of the same second languages. For example, I suspect we're all fluent in the technical professional language of medicine we use in conversation conversation with, with each other for patient care, and the language that we use when we speak directly to patients and families. What is that language we use to speak with patients? It's referred to as plain language, not plain English, because that doesn't accommodate the 350 languages spoken in the United States according to the recent census. So plain language it is. It's not a new language, as evidenced here by the esteemed Sir William Osler, the Canadian physician who is one of Johns Hopkins founders and who wrote the very first internal medicine textbook. So what is plain language? It's got an official definition. A language using words that can be understood the first time they are read or heard. And I always like to add, words that can be remembered, because what needs to be remembered is probably the most important part of what we say. It's also a language considered the opposite of jargon, and I love that explanation of jargon as a language that's sometimes used to impress rather than inform. And it makes me giggle a little because it always reminds me of medical students and residents. If they don't know the answer a question has asked or an attending that it has asked, and instead of just saying, I don't know, I'll get back with you later on that, they'll default and they'll begin to speak in jargon, complex sentence structures that they think is actually going to disguise the fact that they don't know something. It seldom works very well, but it makes me giggle as I think of it as an example of impressing rather than informing. Here are some samples of jargon words. This comes from an academic study, and those highlighted in green are especially of interest to me. The study's authors noted that patients found progressing was thought to be a good thing by patients because in their minds, progress is positive. Same goes for impressive. Now, although an x-ray can be impressive if there's remarkable improvement, most of the time when we say, whoa, that x-ray is impressive, it's not usually a good thing. So as so many things are attempted to be defined in life, jargon is also one of those things that sometimes we often better recognize after we've read it or heard it than when we use it ourselves. Okay, to further organize this discussion around plain language, I thought I'd fall back on a verbal plain language checklist. It's a modified version of a written plain language checklist. As a clinician and healthcare writer, I can endorse that these two checklists are very, very similar. And I touted this talk as a way for you all to just recognize that what you're already doing is valuable. And I would be very surprised if any of you aren't thinking to yourself that you don't do this. Instead, I'm guessing that you all are saying to yourselves, this plain language is just a label for what I'm already doing. What I hope I'm offering is just a way to kind of put your approach into a checklist form that can be leveraged in other ways for training and that type of thing. So start with knowing your audience. You know your audience. You, when you have a patient who's sitting in front of you, you choose the language that best matches who you know they are. And you constantly are assessing, assessing what your patients want to know versus what they need to know. And you are mindfully making certain word choices, sometimes simple, sometimes more complex, 
Sometimes you're re reserved, but sometimes you have to be frank. But you also have an instinct about how much detail that patient sitting in front of you can absorb, knowing sometimes less is more. You also have an instinct about just how to order the information you're sharing with your patients. Sometimes you've got to go good news first, bad news. Sometimes the opposite, what's known, what's unknown, or the reverse, what's easy or what's hard. And you're probably already doing your own self-assessment, which is, is this patient understanding the information I'm sharing? What is my body language saying? What is their body language sh sharing? I want to specifically draw attention to word to number two, word choices, because plain language uses plain words. And I've offered some resources to tap when you get yourself in a pickle and I can't find a, can't find a word to replace a jargon word or a phrase. And you'll notice my cultural linguistic phrase here, when you get yourself into a pickle, meaning when you find yourself challenged or in some kind of trouble. I also want to suggest, especially if you're a primary care provider like myself, don't forget to lean on what our surgical colleagues are already so great at doing, sketching and drawing. Sketch and draw when you can't find the right words. Oh my goodness, the number of times that I've sketched something and a patient has said, doctor, you're not going to win any art awards, but at least now I can understand what you've been trying to tell me. And note, I've only recently learned in interviews with Latino experts that in the Hispanic culture, health education is actually better understood when delivered through what they refer to as the photo novella, information done with pictures and in story form. And there's even a fair amount of evidence for that, and I've included one citation here. So this is my belief. You are probably leveraging plain language more often than you think, and if you're not, Consider doing just that, and for all of you, consider using it as often as possible. What are the benefits of plain language? Well, common sense tells us that plain language is understood the first time it's read or heard, and it should come with automatic saving, time savings and health outcome benefits. So for modern day clinicians with so, so much to be squeezed into waking hours, time can be saved by delivering clear information the first time around so that there is less need for delivering that information in repetition. And that should translate into more minutes of the day that you can get back for yourself. Self-preservation, my friends. For the financial folks listening today, I'd like to leverage that time generates money or time generates revenue. But I offer a challenge to thinking about time as only the key to generating revenue. Instead, think about time as what's needed for activities that are keys to controlling losses. Taking the time to explain something clearly can actually be a key to loss control down the line. This advice was given to me by a very successful hospital CEO. So let's look at plain language related to patient satisfaction scores. And in a personal conversation with a plain language health literacy expert, he had shared that he and his colleagues had been contacted by several urban healthcare delivery systems who discovered they'd been taking a big hit on their patient satisfaction scores due to the jargon words that patients were finding in the electronic health records. And I'm going to use two examples that were relevant to me. You know, we use this word grossly all the time. Actually, when you think about it, it's just a word of non-commitment. We can remain non-committed if we just replace grossly with appears or seems. And the phrase morbid obesity, that phrase has a lot of quality measures, billing, coding impact, and it needs to be found in a record for those reasons. But patients find that very unsettling. So my solution was to use a replacement phrase, non-ideal weight, yet put that coding language, morbid obesity, BMI equals 42, in parentheses. For whatever reason, when that information was put in parentheses, it was much less objectionable to patients. Okay, forms both electronic and paper. The plainer the language, the more streamlined the throughput. 
less time waiting for those patients to complete paperwork before you see them and the paperwork actually completed because it could be understood. Always, always mindful of evidence. Here's the evidence behind plain language benefits. Disappointingly, very little specifically related to plain language, virtually none. However, as we get to the health literacy segment of this presentation, remember, I want you to look back to tie in the fact that health literacy is plain language, and there's lots of evidence supporting that easily read and understood health information has powerful impacts on health outcomes. Despite the dearth of studies around plain language benefits specifically, there is recent evidence that patients prefer plain language. That's a good thing. And I love this study done by the academics from the University of Minnesota. And they've actually done several studies on jargon as part of their NIH translational science work. For this study, they interviewed random fair Minnesota State Farm, uh, excuse me, Minnesota State Fair goers. And when they interviewed these patients, they, or these fair goers, they found about 90% of them preferred a non jargon speaking physician. That doesn't seem of any surprise, correct? So here are the scripts for the jargon speaking and the non jargon speaking doctors. And then here are the comments. And remember, only 90% of those surveyed preferred non jargon. So highlighted in yellow is the perception of those who seem to prefer jargon which just substantiates there's always an outlier, correct? There's also some recent evidence on how physicians actually are using plain language. And this is an interesting multi-center study funded by the NIH Cancer Institute, their conclusions. And I kind of had to chuckle at this because not so much in plain language, that's a little bit of irony here, right? Um, but at least there's starting to be some research around physicians use of plain language and we can hope for some more. For example, the Minnesota folks, again, they've offered a plainer language explanation of jargon categories, which I find um, interesting. If you're going to be doing some research, you can um, use those categories. But avoiding jargon and using plain language really seems very easy in theory, not so easy in reality. And at the federal level, there has long been a focus on plain language. Since around the 1950s, elected officials have been on record stating that everything in the federal code needed to be in plainer language. But it wasn't until 2010 that a law was passed mandating plain language training for the staff of every federal agency. Now, we in medicine know that in theory, training makes a difference. But when it comes to daily use, sometimes it takes more than just training sessions to gain proficiency. And just because I trained, I was trained to use a scalpel as a medical student and a resident doesn't mean I should actually ever use one. But mandated training leads to curriculum for that training. And I am ever so grateful for the website plainlanguage.gov. It has fantastic plain language information for healthcare providers. And I'm a big fan because I leverage both spoken plain language and written plain language on a daily basis. For those listening who are charged with writing policies, content, and anything with words, one of the items offered by plainlanguage.gov is a plain language checklist. And if you don't have your own internal plain language checklist, this is a great framework to either use or modify. Okay, let's talk about class. Out at the Min Office of Minority Health comes class, culturally and linguistically appropriate services. I can finally say that without twisting my tongue there. There are four standards or themes and 15, 15, 15 supporting guidelines. And note, I'm not highlighting any info on this slide about the standards or guidelines, and I'm doing that intentionally. Why? Because what I want to accomplish today is that you all just recognize that what that phrase is referring to and to think to yourself, I'm probably doing some version of what's contained in those four standards and 15 guidelines. So by now you figured out, I always have a quest for definitions and I was surprised that there was no definition for appropriate services. However, there was a definition for cultural and linguistic competence. 
and we've got information about implies having and I found a listicle for the abilities that we should have in order to claim cultural and linguistic competence. However, for me, I believe that the class goals simply drill down to one concept, health equity for all, and especially for those with a primary language other than English, LEP or limited English proficiency. And with my love for all terms specifically defined comes a health equity definition here. And the current administration has a list of 12 communities they believe are experiencing disparities or having health equity issues. For those who are charged with translating medical information from English to other languages, come some advice on language translation, digital.gov. Now digital.gov is part of the federal government's GSA, General Services Administration, and it's an agency that has some oversight duties around language translation technology. And note their advice, use human translators for translations or to review those things that are already translated by AI, artificial intelligence. Why? Because of language pair disparities. So for an example, there's lots of German in the digital environment and written environment. So German, English, English, German translations are not so hard for AI to do. However, if you're translating those unique African or Indic languages, there's not many language pairs around for that. So humans translators do a better job than AI. A second reason to use human translators uh, is that AI has difficulty with idiomatic expressions and nuanced language use. So how would AI translate flare up, feeling blue, clean bill of health, cold sweats, or even as I used earlier, being in a pickle? All right, I'd like to share some actual clinical experiences of providing clinical and linguistically appropriate services. And the first is actually culturally appropriate. And this came from uh, some genetic researchers who were tracking genetically transmitted conditions in the Marshallese culture. What they discovered is that there's a unique culture around adoption. One family with many children will give one of their children to another family who is unable to have children. And the child given then is considered that mother and father's child by birth. A decade ago, one Iowa community formally trained their new physicians who were coming outside of the America in the language and the culture of the ag community they were serving. Same for me when I did locums in Alaska and took care of loggers. And when I practiced in Western North Dakota and took care of oil field workers, there's a linguistics and a culture there that's unlike others. And then there's the linguistic thing that I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, because really the first time that I thought about this was actually when one of my journalism school colleagues burst out into uncontrolled, just he was laughing hysterically. And when we were finally able to ask him why, he said, I have just read something translated from English to Spanish that was so ridiculous. So that goes for human translation. My own family, my, although my Polish-speaking, English-speaking mother-in-law had passed before I met my husband, her family shared that when it came to any question involving time, she always had to first translate that question from English to Polish in her head, retrieve the answer in Polish, and then translate it back to English before she could share the time answer in English. And she always was concerned about the accuracy of her translation. <laughs> I would just think it's kind of hard to uh, keep medical appointments with that going on. And last is another personal story. In the late 1990s, I cared for a deaf patient who taught me a really important lecture on cultural and linguistics. And I have her permission to share the story, and it goes like this. Her personal prefer preference for communication was lip reading. Of course, my staff and I were happy that we didn't have to write everything out because that was going to take more time. So this patient would come to see me and office visits were easy and pleasant. She'd laugh, she'd giggle, and I always appreciated just her pleasant demeanor. 
So finally, when I shared that with her, she told me it had nothing to do with her personality and everything to do with me. She said it was near impossible to keep laughing because I looked so goofy because I was exaggerating my mouth for speaking, thinking that that made my lips more readable. And it wasn't. And so I was very grateful for the lesson that she provided me that for lip readers, just speak naturally and slowly and they'll understand. So when it comes to class, as we're nudged into formally proving that we're implementing these standards, realize that whether you are an individual provider or a healthcare delivery system administrator, you are very likely to already be using some kind of plain language and you're already mindful of the cultures and linguistics in your practice. You're already doing likely a whole lot more than you might think you are. So one last piece of advice though, make sure to engage your patient and users. If class still feels a bit hard, don't forget, lean on others to help you do hard better. For example, your Great, great Plains QIN staff has a great playbook on class. Okay, moving on to health literacy. In my opinion, still one of the best class explanations around communication was given almost a decade ago by Darcy Graves, who's currently a technical advisor at CMS's Office of Minority Health. And maybe I'm partial to that webinar because she makes the case, case clear for the use of plain language and health literacy. And as I start this health literacy discussion, yes, back to my love for definitions, let's tease apart health literacy. And I always think it was so nice of the World Health Organization to take on the definition of health so many, many years ago. And it's pretty much still uncontested today. And look at the definition of literacy as task, as skills. And essentially, literacy involves using written information to just get along in the world. But when I think about the intersection of literacy and health, I ask myself these two questions. Can I improve literacy? Can I improve my patient's health? In my opinion, I don't believe I can improve my patient's literacy, but yes, I believe there is something connected to literacy that allows me to impact, impact my patient's health and well being. And what is that one thing? Speaking, not just writing in plain language, and leveraging the basic health literacy concepts. So again, with the definitions, um, definitions are coming out of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. And the first one is personal health literacy, the ability to find in addition to understanding information and then understanding it well enough to use it. And I like to paraphrase it because I think it is just a little bit more complicated. It is the degree to which individuals will personally take on the task and leveraging their ability and skill set to find and sift through all the brochures and today's internet health information to understand and understand it well enough to use the information and services to inform health related decisions and take action for themselves. Quick FYI, here are some examples of skill levels as outlined by researchers and experts in order to classify health literacy into these categories. And notice the absence of reading grade levels, instead the skill levels. Now in 2019 came a big thing for healthcare delivery systems and their providers. An addition of organizational health literacy definition, ultimately making us all more accountable to our patients and their need for health information. Now, I actually stumbled on health literacy back when I was doing my journalism master's work as a reporter. And I imagine that many of you listening to this presentation feel the same way that I did back then. Plain language and health literacy were kind of floating around in my subconscious, unlabeled, but absolutely doing this, um, absolutely influencing the stuff that I was doing for patient care. And once I became more mindful of the labels and the concepts, I realized there was a lot of stuff I could do a whole lot better for my patients. And when I first came to RHI Hub, I was assigned to write a rural health literacy story. And year over year, those were pretty highly viewed stories. So five years later, we decided to feature it again with updates. And we've even created a health literacy toolkit. Now providers, 
if you're picking up on the fact that health literacy seems to be mostly a written thing and you never plan to write one word of a health education document, this is information still for you. Why? Because it applies to the spoken word. And you are clinical care experts. At some point, you might be asked to review what someone else has written for accuracy and clarity. And if you have some understanding of plain language, that's going to help you copy edit what they've given you. And especially because your patients are end users. The better the written information, the less correction you have to do in the office, the hospital, or the emergency room. Okay, now admittedly, I have a lot of expertise in this area, but I want you to hear some basic health literacy concepts from health literacy experts themselves, the people who work in this field full time. And these quotes um, came from interviews that I did for the online magazines that I wrote in 2017 and 2022. When I give audiences the statistics that a third to a half of Americans have just trouble reading, and then I tell them only one in 10 have any proficiency understanding health information, they sit in stunned silence. And of those one of that one out of 10 that actually is considered proficient, just give them a cancer diagnosis, make them sleep deprived, experiencing severe pain, any of those things that happen all the time in a hospital or an emergency room or the clinic, anybody, anybody with those things going on is going to have trouble understanding, processing, remembering, or making decisions related to health information. Think about it. Providers don't need patients to translate plain language into medical jargon, but we providers forget to translate our information back into plain language. This automatically, automatically creates an unequal system. And this is the point that gets to me. Translating back in plain language. It is a way we can provide each and every patient or reader culturally and linguistically appropriate information that they can understand and act on. It's up to us. Health literacy is a pretty straightforward idea. You know, most people have experienced, though, that getting good care and services can be a little bit more burdensome than it really needs to be. But patients feel it's their problem. But we're the ones. We've created the burdensome system, and therefore, it's our problem. My job is showing everyday words can actually maximize the professional look around the uh, sound of a medical message. And there again, jargon does not make anybody look professional. It makes you look like you can't translate your information, what's up here, into plain language that comes out there. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite quotes. Health literacy is not actively arguing about a health behavior that must be used. That is not going to work for a lot of people. That's pretty much predictable human behavior there. But it's making sure that people have access to well-vetted health information that's easy to understand. And again, my opinion, but it's one of those things where you know some people need that specific approach. Sometimes you actually have to advocate an approach. But it's been my experience that most patients don't need that, don't want that. And if you give them information in plain language that you are sure they've understood, they'll make the right choice for them. Now, they're, the right choice for them may not always be the choice that we'd like them to make. But if we've given them information that is understandable, we've done right by them. Okay, academic um, evidence behind health literacy. There's lots on big economic impact, and here's one of many studies. And another study here um, points out um, the benefits, the economic benefits. But I want to point out that the last survey of health literacy on a national level was in 2003, and the experts say it'll be unlikely to ever be surveyed again, so it will be difficult to do these kinds of studies in the future. 
But if you're looking for evidence-based information around health literacy and health outcomes, there are lots of studies. And here's one, and a PubMed search will lead you to many more. But moving back to the more practical issues of health literacy. Again, I, I believe I can't improve somebody's health literacy, but when I acknowledge that fact, I can still impact my patient's health by making sure I communicate in words and ways that they understand. Okay, but me just saying that doesn't ensure that that's what's happening, correct? So how do I know I'm making myself clear? Teach back method. Now, if you've ever taken a patient provider communica communication course, a medical educator course, or other like courses, you're probably familiar with this. But here it is again. It's a simple construct. It's a way for us providers to assess if our patients have understood the information we've shared. But really key to this teach back method is that the patient should never feel like they're the ones being tested. For example, go back to the non-jargon speaking doctor script from the Minnesota State Fair study. How should that doctor ask that patient if they understood his information? Well, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has a great healthcare literacy tool kit, and I especially appreciate their focus that leverages universal precautions for this issue around health literacy. And they actually give some ideas for teach back questions, but for my own style, the can you makes me personally feel like I'm testing the patient, so that doesn't really work for me. So here's a couple other questions. You know, do you have any questions to explain this well? Uh, obviously, those don't work either for these reasons, but maybe the third bullet point is a potential, and sometimes I will ask that of my patients. Okay, I've used a lot of my own words to explain this stuff. But you, when you get home and you want to tell somebody what's going on, what are you going to tell them? And that remains the challenge for teach back. It has to be tailored to the patient conversation you've just had. It's just as difficult for patients to find the right words to tell us if we failed them in clearly explaining something as it is for us to find the right words to ask our patients if we've been clear. Wrapping up on the plain language health literacy teach back tool, just because teach back is hard doesn't mean I don't use it. I still think it's a great tool. And I use it now just as much in my non-clinical work as I did in my clinical work. So my recommendation is stick with it. Consider tweaking it until it works for you and your practice and the patient that was sitting in front of you. And eventually it does become a time saver. Last slide to wrap up the first three objectives, a great source that I've actually found includes most of the information you'll ever take away from a health literacy certificate course. Okay, last objective, leveraging planned language and health literacy in community engagement. Last definition slide, believe it or not, the definition for community engagement is actually hard to find. And here's the definition, but I will also say that for any project that you're doing, you have to further define who your community is. And I love this advice about community engagement from a rural GME expert. Um, and I think it has, I like it because it has some um, universal application. He says it's a must in this step in engaging is getting with your non-medical community. And a lot of the health literacy experts say the same. We tend to ask each other if our information seems correct, but we fail to invite our, not, our patients in to have them give us feedback on that information. So rethink your stakeholders. Just when you think you've figured out everybody you should um, get to, you probably haven't. My advice is also to remember what we do is hard and Sometimes the more hesitant you are to engage a particular non-medical or even medical stakeholder because they're going to complicate your efforts, usually the more likely that stakeholder is the key to our efforts. So embrace that naysayer and 
Here, the pediatrician in me comes out and says, don't forget the teenagers. Get feedback from teenagers. They have to take care of each other. They have to take care of younger siblings. And often they're taking care of their elders. So teenagers are a great person to invite to the uh, population to invite to the table. OK, here is a community engagement project I'm involved with as a writing advisor, the Targeted Rural Health Education Project. And evidence tells us that rural populations have difficulty finding health information for many reasons. But evidence also tells us that rural newspapers reach many readers. Publishing health information in them became core to this project. For our health profession students, and to date mostly uh, medical students, we've had some occupational therapy students but the, the students can benefit from a real-time experience around plain language and health literacy, and we leverage that need to create content. They write the articles. In turn, the students also get to list the project as a personal community engagement project, and they get a great literature publication for their CVs. Okay, in addition to the newspapers which publish these stories, the North Dakota Rural Health Association, as a partner, hosts them electronically. I'd love for you to come to this site and skim these stories because this is plain language at its most pure. These stories are about 500 words, and because they're short, they have to leverage plain language by using the best words and using the fewest words. And because adults can read at almost 200 words per minute, you can skim a lot of those stories pretty quickly. So why rural newspapers and not another media option? Well, because the data says rural newspaper subscriptions are widespread. And as Mr. Bierman from Nebraska suggested, print offers something different than radio and TV sound bites. Here is um, a slide that shows our um, tree outcomes. The bad news is we, we don't have funding to do the teach back. We'd love to find those rural newspaper readers and ask them directly. Have you read the stories? Did they make sense? Was this information you thought you needed or realized you needed? Instead, we have the reader surrogate voice from the newspaper editors who've told us that the community's reaction is, why don't you publish more of these stories? Um, a couple of years ago, we finally looked at viewership, kind of like, how, how come we just did it? couple of years ago, we kind of forgot we could. So we checked the web page and realized that year over year, about 5,000 views, 5,000 eyes come to that website. And we'll look again here at the first part of May. And what we thought, we were pleased that most of the stories had an average of about 40 views, ranging anywhere from five views to almost 370. And the most viewed story on that website year over year is a 2018 story on farm injuries. So suggestions for some plain language public health education projects. As an organization, don't hesitate to create original content in-house. Nobody knows your community like you do. And I always say it's kind of like this. Do you want a homemade rhubarb pie? Or do you want a store-bought kind of taste like rhubarb pie? Creating in-house content helps you achieve culturally and linguistically appropriate information for your community. Here is just one example of how homemade health information makes a lot of sense to people. In 2017, we published a story on colon cancer screening that included a homemade video. And in 2021, we watched viewership go up to over a half a million views. Well, March is colorectal cancer awareness month. And the takeaway for us, sometimes homemade can provide really great shareable information. One approach for print media is partner with your local newspaper, create content. You all create the content for a special edition. You write the content. You can also advertise your healthcare services, then bulk mail it so it reaches everybody with an address and distribute it to your local businesses. And I do want to make this point. Just out from the Appropriations Committee, a recognition that local media has power in rural and underserved areas. So HHS has been directed for any of their public health campaign messages, those agencies need to connect with 
rural media outlets. And my hope will be that those communication teams will also connect with those of us in healthcare delivery systems to ensure that the message is culturally and linguistically appropriate because federal agencies have to write for everybody. We know how to write for our own communities. Okay, to wrap up and clarify this talk's goal, leverage and expand your current use of plain language. Emphasize your personal and organizational attention to the nuances of culture and linguistics. Those things can impact your healthcare delivery to the urban and rural populations you'll serve. And in the end, you'll save time, you'll be able to capitalize on the fact that you've saved time, and you're very likely to have improved health outcomes. For those of you who were familiar or very familiar with everything in this presentation, I still hope that you have found one or two perspectives that might help you approach your work a bit differently. For those of you who are unfamiliar, welcome to what plain language class and health literacy might offer you personally and your organization. And to all of you, thanks for your attention. Well, as I struggle to turn my camera back on here. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for starting this conversation. That was really great information and want to continue the conversation. So we invite um, anybody to take themselves off of mute um, and ask a question. Or if you have a question or a comment, um, please feel free to put that in chat. I'm not seeing anything yet. A lot of resources were shared in chat. Um, you've got one thank you for some of the resources as well. So uh, maybe as people are thinking, I will ask a couple of things. And I just wanted to say that I appreciated that you uh, talked about a couple of the subcultures that we sometimes see. You know, North Dakota and South Dakota are very frontier rural states, as you know, you know, the loggers, the oil field workers, the farmers. A lot of times when we hear, hear terms that are related to health equity, our minds go to race and ethnicity and foreign languages, but the culture is so much more than that. And um, I think what you're saying is to make the language relatable in terms that they understand. So if a rancher comes in and says he injured his um, leg from a bale feeder falling on it, you know, the provider has to know what that means and then also communicate back to the patient that way. Um, another question I thought of was, you know, what impact do you think, you know, in this day and age of information overload, misinformation, disinformation, um, maybe Dr. Google, you know, what in impact do you think all of those things have on health, health literacy? Huge amount. And, you know, sometimes it amazes me about how much time patients actually have or take to look through and gather this information and they'll bring it into the office or their families will bring it into the hospital room and like you to go over things. And I think it's important to acknowledge that what they've done is important and that you value it. However, we all kind of develop our own scripts for patients when we have time constraints and that we're concerned with some of the stuff that they get from the internet, we recognize what's well-vetted health information. Uh, for example, cancer patients. I love NCCN's patient information for um, cancer, the National Cancer Care Network, I think that stands for. Um, so sometimes I'll look through that information and I'll put, oh, this is a good site or that was a good site. Oftentimes though, what I tell them is this, once they've shared what information they'll have, I'll tell them, you know, I had a really good dad. And one of the things that my dad told me when I went off to college is that in order to be successful, you're going to have to listen to advice. You don't have to take that advice, but you should listen to that advice. And so patient sitting in front of me, I'm going to ask you, I've got some advice to share and I'd love for you to listen to it. You don't have to take it but I'd appreciate you listening to my advice. I have found that that made, as I say, ears get big. Just allowing patients, acknowledging what they've done is not a bad thing, but offering them a way and for you to express what you think is best for them. I'm not sure. I hope that was maybe somewhat helpful answer. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> 
and not seeing anything else in the chat. Just remind you, if you want anybody wants to come off chat off of mute, you can um, feel free to do that and ask a question or make a comment. And I, I want to mention too, if anybody wants to send me questions, there's my email and I'm happy to address any questions that you might have, um, especially after you think about things for a while. I presented a lot of information pretty quickly, so I welcome any email questions. I do have one more um, that I was thinking of. So if you do have a difficult message to deliver to a patient, like a difficult diagnosis. Um, do you have a tried and true method to do that using plain language? I think, you know, um, w when you are delivering difficult um, information, or I always say sad, sad things, um, is to acknowledge that you're going to share some information that is sad. It's sad for you, and it's probably going to be sad for them. And you should use, there again, few words, plain words, and don't rush. Um, allow the patient to hear things. If the patient is there with someone else, make sure you've engaged both of them. I've got sad news for you. Everybody, I would like um, everybody to listen closely to what I'm going to share. I'm going to share some information. A lot of times, in those kinds of situations, again, providers, we always feel like we don't have time for this. And I find that delivering that information and then telling the patient, I'm going to have you sit here and process this or think about it and come up with some questions. I'm going to go and I'm going to see my next patient and then I'm going to come back and see you. Or if you're in the hospital, I'm going to go see another patient up on the fifth floor and then I'm going to come back. But key to any um, sad diagnoses is time to process while you're still there. Oh, and oh, and make sure you're watching body language because there may be more than sadness, there may be anger. And it's okay for patients to be angry. So thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, but in the chat, we're seeing some thank yous for the great information. And, and yes, we will be sending out some references. Um, I'll invite you to continue to think about any questions or comments. And as we close out the session, just a reminder that attendees will receive a certificate of participation for submission to your applica uh, applicable accrediting or licensing body for CE credit and will be sent via email. Um, Great Plains Quinn is an approved provider of continuing education with North Dakota Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrators and South Dakota Board of Nursing Facility Administrators. And um, as you leave the webinar today, um, there will be a complete an evaluation form. Or will that be put in the chat, Kelsey, or will they get it when they log out? Yep. I always forget how that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll also email to all registrants um, today the um, resources, so you'll be getting a follow-up email as well. Yes, you will be getting the PowerPoint. When we share the, the link to the recording, the PowerPoint usually accompanies that. It's right all on that same page. So yes, you will get, um, get all the resources. You get a lot of resources to share, so really great information. We thank you for that. All right, we have a few minutes to spare. Anybody have any parting words or parting thoughts? Um, I'm going to ask the audience a question. So when we sent out the pre-questions, um, we asked if if everybody was familiar with plain language. And there was about, I, when I counted, the statistics showed about 12% of the people were unfamiliar with plain language. And so just curious um, now if we've flipped all of you to um, being <laughs> experts on plain language. <laughs> Anybody's willing to share? Well, um, this is Lars um, out of Michigan here. So, I mean, I was, I guess I implement or use plain language, but not really being aware that that's what I'm trying to do. Yes. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is way more in depth. So there's lots of good information and, and to see how, you know, we can do better than what we're currently doing. So um, it's, it's interesting because I always tell them, like, as we're doing the teach back, I'm like, 
Now, this isn't a test. We want you to be successful. We want you to, you know, be knowledgeable and comfortable. And so all of those reminders, like, you know, here's the information. You're not being quizzed. So it's interesting. And, and I'm assuming that that's okay to be like, hey, we're not testing you. We just want to make sure that you're understanding, you know, what we're information we're providing. Right. I mean, that's kind of where I, I go about. Oh, I I love it that you recognize that you're already doing some of these things. Sometimes, you know, we naturally as care providers are trying to use those plain language or leveraging those things, but until they actually get labeled as something, we don't always understand that we are doing those things, which is what I happened to me when I was in J school and I did my first story on health literacy. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are things I've been doing, but because they've been unlabeled in my head, I haven't been as mindful. So once you become mindful of it, then you start leveraging your skill set a bit more. Um, as far as the teach back thing, it is an incredible valuable tool, but I don't think it's as easy to use. So I practice using it all the time. Um, just because I'm not at the clinical bedside now, I am still, I get a lot of clinical questions and I will go through things. And then at the end, I always have to say, now I've given you a lot of information. What was the most, what do you think the most important thing was for you? Or what was the biggest surprise in this information that I just shared? And then sometimes that gives you just leverage to go from someplace else. But I think it's really hard for us to ask patients if we've done them good um, as it is for them to say, you know what? <laughs> it's it's hard for us to tell you, you didn't, I, I don't understand the a word that you you gave me, so. Yeah, you know, I've it, been, oh, I'm, ahead, I'm sorry, well, that's a, it's a good point. Sometimes it's, it's the simplest phrases to, for the yes. teach back, like, you know, what was the biggest surprise in, in the information that I provided you? And, and it's, and then that, I think, also then elicits more conversation without yes. being it accusatory, like, why didn't you understand that type of thing? So yeah. it's good. Yeah. And that's where I always um, struggle is what phrase am I looking for? So, I mean, you just saying something like that triggers yeah. all of these things in my head, like, oh, I can say this and I can do that. And Again, it's the simplest things, but until you actually recognize it, um, it, it, you know, now you can focus a little bit more on being better and more productive yes. at that. So, yeah, thank you. An another important question is what scared you most about what I said? Because sometimes when we ask that question, we realize, uh oh, we said something and they didn't hear anything else. So, you know, sometimes it's just those. And again, it all it's so dependent on the conversation that you've had, what the topic was, what the themes were. So um, anyway, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that information you, you made, I, you endorsed a lot of important items there. So thank you, Les. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I was just thinking too, um, part of that is some motivational interviewing techniques. Yeah. You know, is part oh, yeah. of that. And so yeah. normalizing, yeah. I was thinking back to my days of doing diabetes education and um, instead of asking them, well, how many times a week do you forget to check your blood sugar? Um, or, or instead of asking them, do you forget to check your blood sugar? Just say, how many times a week do you think you miss it? You know, just kind of normalizing some of those things. Yes. And then it just becomes more conversational and they, they feel free to, you know, maybe divulge more helpful information to help you provide um, better care. So, Good questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for your time. And please reach out if there's anything else we can provide for you. And there will be some follow-up information in an email. Thanks so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Temple, or Kay. I know you like to be called Kay. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your time. <laughs>